Kenny is the lead pastor of The Gathering Harlem. He's a Harlem native and a suffering Knicks fan. Raised on these streets, he believed that he would one day escape them and move on to greener pastures, but God had a different plan. In 2017, Kenny, his wife Shanika, and their children started The Gathering. It has quickly grown to be an influential church with over 250 people at their location at the National Black Theater in Harlem. So please give a warm Eastview welcome to Pastor Kenny Hart. All right, amen, amen. Thank y'all for the love. I'm feeling that. What's up, Eastview? How y'all feeling? Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. How y'all feeling? Have y'all been enjoying day one of the Influence Conference? <clears throat> well, listen, um, before I get started, I want to give a major shout out to everybody watching online. And I know my gathering family is watching all the way from Harlem. Could y'all show them some love? Yeah. What up, TGH? Um, and, and I already know, I already know my wifey, wife, my wife, yes, put a ring on it. I know she's watching. Um, all the way from Harlem, so hey, boo, I'll be home soon. <laughs> all right, so, um, so listen, um, can we praise God for visionary leaders? Can we do that? Can we do that? Um, your pastor, um, Pastor Mike and, and the elders of this church, um, created, I think, an amazing event where God literally brought the nations together under one roof with all of the people that your generosity has helped to bless and support and all of the moves of God all over the world that's happening beyond America and beyond Bloomington Normal. And I think you guys should give God praise for that. And I think you should give yourself some love for that. Amen. Go ahead. All righty. So now that that's out the way, I got one more order of business. So can we have an honest conversation? Can we do that family? We family, right? Okay, okay, um, I'm a chocolate preacher, <laughs> as you could tell. So I, I ain't gonna hold you, I, I'm gonna do my best to stay in my allotted time, um, but, but, but I'm not making you no promises, so I hope you got dinner on, on the crock pot or something. Um, <laughs> secondly, I, I come from a tradition where sermons are dialogues and not monologues. So, so, so I'm going to need you to talk to me a little bit. I, I, I'm going to need you guys to, to, to get a Red Bull, get some coffee, but, but, but I'm going to need you to talk to me. Um, um, and so if you don't know what to say, let me help you out. Um, if the sermon is sounding good, you can give me an amen. amen. There we go. If, um, if, it's hit, if it's good, but it's hitting a little bit too close to home, give me an ouch. And if it's just real good and it's all up in your kitchen, just give me a deacon hum, like, mm-hmm. All right, we good? All right, so let me pray for us. Let's ask God to bless our time, and then let's see what the Lord has for us tonight. Father God, uh, we are grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to gather as your people, God, hearing amazing stories and testimonies like what you're doing um, in, in Pastor Bob's church and, and, and just all of the churches all around the world, God, that you've gathered and assembled, God, and, and through the generosity of this church, all the people that are being blessed, God, I'm, I'm just blown away and honored and humbled to be here. Father, we are praying that your spirit come down. Father, this church is, is called to be a fearless church. This church um, is seeking to have influence in its context. This church is seeking to do what the early church did, which is, which is see fire fall from heaven and see lives transformed and see cities restored and see See homes rebuilt. And so, God, I'm just praying that you get this dust of a man out the way so your people can see you. And I'm praying that the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, God, our strength and our redeemer. Oh, who give that said? Amen. Amen. Well, listen, family, it's an incredible honor to be with you guys today. Um, I'm bringing peace and blessings in this new decade all the way from Harlem, New York. It is a new decade. Yes, we should be praising God for new mercies. It's a new decade. So whatever happened in 2019, leave it in 2019. Whatever happened in 2015, leave it in 2015. God has said, behold, I'm making all things new. You're in a new decade. Amen, somebody. Um, and so when Pastor Mike called me to speak um, at this conference about uh, being a fearless church, uh, quite frankly, I, 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 was, I was terrified. <laughs> because... Um, uh, I may look courageous, but I'm scared of many things. And as I prayed about what God might give me to say to a group of leaders and to a church this diverse and dynamic, what I kept hearing from God is, if my people are going to learn how to be a fearless church, they're going to have to learn how to walk in conviction. Amen. So that's where we're going today. If you have your Bibles, I'm a parallel park in Nehemiah chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 8. And, 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 and basically, I, I want to pull some, some truths from this text and learn some things about the convictions that we're going to need if we're going to move out into our world and be a fearless church. Amen? Amen? So listen, all of us are leaders in the room. Whether you have a title of leadership or not, you're a leader. Whether you know it or not, you're a leader. And, 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 and can I be honest with you? Leadership is hard. If you lead anything, if you lead a business, a company, a church, a home, a team, a ministry, a family, children, I mean, you try to lead anything and it's hard. Despite all the glitz and glam of the title, the fact is the responsibility of leadership far outweighs the rewards of leadership. Leading well is a struggle, isn't it? Leading well forces you to take sides, uh, 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 pick positions, uh, and you always find yourself between problems and praise. But that's ultimate because good leadership centers on conviction. So what is conviction? Conviction is the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what one believes and says. Let me say that again for the people in the back. (laughs) Conviction is the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what one believes and says. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of my personal heroes and I believe the greatest American we've ever produced. And he understood this principle well when he said, a man of conscience can never be a consensus leader. He doesn't take a stand in order to search for consensus, but is ultimately a molder of consensus. When we look at Nehemiah, we see a man who, though, was he, though, though he was a contemporary of Ezra and Malachi, wasn't a priest like Ezra and wasn't a prophet like Malachi. In fact, Nehemiah was an everyday dude. Nehemiah was a lot like many of us. He was a cupbearer to a pagan king. And, and you thought your job was bad. So surely when Nehemiah hears that his hometown of Jerusalem is in ruins in chapter 1, he wrestles with doubt and insecurity just like us. In a group this large, there's no doubt in my mind that God has placed many convictions in your heart. Convictions to see radical change in your homes. Convictions to see radical gospel change in your churches. Conviction to see a move of God in your businesses. Conviction to see God move in your city. But like Nehemiah, you feel unequipped for the task. But the lesson that Nehemiah teaches us is this. God uses all manner of people in all manner of places to do all manner of work for his glory. You missed that. I said God uses all manner of people. Yes, you. All manner of people. To do in all manner of places. Yeah, I know you didn't go to the best school and yeah, I know you don't have a bunch of letters after your name, but yes, he uses people from all manner of places. Y'all know Jesus was from the hood, right? He was from Nazareth. The Bible said, can anything good come from there? That's the hood. He uses all manner of people in all manner of places to do all manner of work for his glory. Nehemiah reminds us that God's not limited by your abilities. He's limited by your obedience. So if we're going to lead out of conviction today and not convenience, the first thing we need to see is leading with conviction forces us to reject comfort. In verse 1 of today's passage, it reads, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King are the Xerxes. We're just going to call them Xerxes. Is that cool? All right, cool. Uh, When wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king, and I had not been sad in his presence before. Now, if we're going to understand what's happening in this text, we're going to have to go a step back and look at what we've already learned about Nehemiah. The book opens up with him chilling in the palace at Susa. He got his feet up. He eating grapes off the stem. He drinking wine out of a golden chalice. It's looking like a scene from Game of Thrones or something. That's that's, that's what it's looking like. Nehemiah's living the life. That's where we find him in chapter 1. In fact, the one thing we know for sure about Nehemiah is when the rest of the Jews go back to Jerusalem to see what the state of the city is in chapter 1, Nehemiah don't go with them. In fact, he finds out about the destitute condition of his city through the word of mouth of those who had the courage to actually go look. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why Nehemiah decided to stay, but humor me for a second as I use my sanctified imagination. Is that cool? (laughs) Maybe Nehemiah stayed because he was afraid to leave his royal duties. It's a possibility. 
Maybe Nehemiah stayed because he was intimidated by the cumbersome work of starting over. How many of you know starting over is hard? Some of us have stayed in things too long because we don't want to start over. You stayed in relationships, you know God said to end a long time ago because you ain't want to go back to relationship status as single. You stayed in a career that you know God called you out of a long time ago because you didn't want to be the talk of, of your family or the town. You stayed in schools and in places you knew you should have moved on from because you didn't want to endure the cumbersome work of starting over. Maybe he was afraid to start over. Maybe Nehemiah was afraid of the opposition he was going to face trying to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, as plausible as all those options are, I think Nehemiah stayed not because he was afraid and not because he was lazy and certainly not because he was fearful. I believe Nehemiah stayed because he was comfortable. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nehemiah was in the palace living the life that we're all chasing. Yeah, he was. He had a good job, nice house, good car that got good gas mileage, good wife, good kids, oh, and he had a white picket fence to go with it. He was, living his, he was living a dream. But all of that desire for comfort ultimately kept him on the sidelines and out of the fight. This raises an important question for those of us in the room to wrestle with because when God calls us, he always calls us to step into a battle. There is no comfortable calling in the Bible. There is nobody who kept what they liked to do and was comfortable doing after God called them to something. In fact, I say it this way all the time. There's no blessings without battles. See, so many of us are praying for blessings right now, but, but, but we don't want the battles that we got to fight in order to get them. But, but you don't get no battles without, you don't get no blessings without battles. So my question for you is, what's the reason, what's the reason that you're staying out of the fight and joining God to renew your city? What's your reason? It's so easy for us to sit on the sidelines and wave pom-poms <laughs> for those that are doing the hard work of justice, reconciliation, in renewal, but it's much harder for us to really wrestle with God and ask him, what could my role be in all of this? Which means comfort isn't just Nehemiah's problem, it's ours too. That was the ouch point. <laughs> Some of you have it all. A good job, good benefits, good family, good house, good kids, good reputation. And you become so comfortable with good that you forgot that Jesus called us to great. When did good become the standard of the Christian life? Jesus said the greatest among you will be a servant of all. That's not the call of Christ on our lives. Christ does not call us to comfort. Christ died in discomfort. And his call is never to comfort. It's always to conviction. And let me help somebody out today. God isn't trying to make you a better you. I know you're cute and all that, and you like you, but <laughs> God ain't trying to make you a better you. He's trying to make you look more like his son. And we should be praising God that his standard for us is higher than us. Amen. God's highest aim for our lives is not to look like the best version of ourselves. God's highest aim for our lives is to look like Jesus. <laughs> See, comfort competes with Christ. Comfort fights Christ on every turn because comfort wants to keep us out of fights that Christ wants to call us into. Comfort is risk averse. Christ is risk K. You got to say K on it. <laughs> See, because we often want our lives to be a controlled descent, but the reality is, can I help you? Faith is a free fall. Faith is faith is stepping out of the boat in the middle of a storm because Jesus gave you a word. That's faith. Faith is moving forward with the Red Sea in front of you and Pharaoh's army behind you. That's faith. Faith is always risky and you can never control it. And Nehemiah knows that if he's going to step out in faith, he's going to have to step into the unknown. God is calling somebody in here to step into the unknown. If we choose to continue in comfort, not only will we be unfulfilled, we will be found unfaithful. We'll reduce Jesus to a wallet-sized savior. And when's the last time you've been inspired by a wallet-sized anything? Here's a final question that really sums up this first point. How's your life 
presently interconnected with a struggle bigger than yourself? That's the gospel question for all of us in this first point. Point number two, leading with conviction forces us to move out in compassion. Look with me at verse two, y'all. It says, the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you ain't even sick? That's how I read the Bible, (laughs) y'all. This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. And Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. Nehemiah's convictions are so palpable at this point now, they're showing all over his countenance. He can't hide it anymore. When, when, King, when King Xerxes notices it, he gets shook. And Nehemiah gets shook because in these days, in the ancient world, it was considered a privilege to be in the presence of a king. <laughs> Did y'all know it's a privilege to be in the presence of the king? We don't treat being in the presence of the king like it's a privilege but it's a privilege. And in the ancient world, you didn't come into the, pre- in the presence of a king with sadness. You came into the presence of the king with gladness. It was a sign of disrespect to come into the presence of the king with sadness. And yet Nehemiah's convictions are burning so, so hot for his people that he can't even hide it. It's on his countenance. And Nehemiah breaks in the process a social taboo. But he does it because love is what's bleeding out of him. In the process of doing this, Nehemiah decides that breaking a social taboo is more important than betraying his heart. That's a word for somebody in here. Because somebody in here is afraid to step into something that God has called you to do. You know it's a God dream. You know it's a God vision. But you're afraid to do it because in the process of doing it, you're going to have to break some social norms. You're going to have to love some people that society says you shouldn't love. You're going to have to cross those tracks. You're going to have to go to the other side of town. You're going to have to do some work that people around you who love you won't understand. You're going to have to leave something that's comfortable in order to step into a calling, and you're scared to do it because you're going to have to break a social taboo in the process. But this is what I love about Jesus. One of the things I love about Jesus is he was always breaking the rules of men. This is what I love about Jesus. I mean, I mean, Jesus ate with pimps, with pimps and prostitutes. He, 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 he had meals with tax collectors. He, he fellowshiped with people that society had thrown away. He took women as disciples. All of this was a social taboo in the ancient world. Do you understand me? But he did all of this because he knew regardless of the social cost, listen to me, the cost of disobedience is always greater. Let me tell you something. The cost of betraying what God has put in your heart is always greater than the cost of losing people's opinion and affirmation on earth. So Nehemiah's pain is bleeding into every part of his life. And and now even Xerxes sees it when he says, why is your face sad seeing that you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. The king knows that Nehemiah doesn't have a head cold he has a heart cold. He doesn't have the flu of the body. He has the flu of the soul. In the black tradition, we call this the blues. That's what this is. We call it, I mean, you know, the black, listen, the Bible just ain't nothing new under the sun. We, we, we call this the blues in the black tradition. Well, 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 one of the lies that we've adopted as Christians is, that it is the lie that success is the highest ideal. I'm sorry, where does God say, be successful as I am successful? It's a lie from the pit of hell. And yet we live as if success is the highest ideal. And what it's done to the church is it's created a Christianity that always wants to win, but never wants to lose. But when we look at Jesus, we see a Savior that wins by losing. You missed that. Jesus triumphs over sin, death, and Satan by dying. Now, now I don't know what you measure winning by, by, but but by any metric, everybody at the cross, including Jesus' own followers, thought he lost. But Satan didn't know that in the very L he thought he was handing Jesus, he gave him a victory, a W, that would go for generations to come until until eternity passed. 
that Satan handed Jesus a temporary L but gave him an eternal W. Oh my God. <laughs> Jesus had to lose his life though in order to save ours. That's our message. We're a people that don't win by winning. We win by losing. Jesus said whoever wants to save his life must lose it. We win by losing. We've lost the blues in our Christianity, family. What's the blues? Some theologians call it the already not yet, but it's so much more than that. The blues is living life in a tension between triumph and tragedy. The blues is life between catastrophe and consummation. The blues is the space between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Our American dream mentality produces prisoners of comfort, but a blue-shaped faith produces prisoners of hope. The blues makes us prisoners of hope because in the tension between tragedy and triumph, hope is all you have. And Nehemiah is living in the middle of that tension. His people are home, and yet they're homeless at the same time. There's nothing left in Jerusalem but memories of what was. And Nehemiah's response was not to boast. His response was the blues. If we're going to lead with conviction, if we're going to be a fearless church, if we're going to move out into the world with the faith that moves mountains, we're going to have to learn how to lead and love with compassion. We must be a people that can look at the current state of our culture, both on a micro and macro level, and realize that in order to be obedient to Jesus, we have to hate what's happening in the world enough to change it, but we have to love the world enough to think it worth changing. You have to do both at the same time. And look at how Nehemiah embodies that in this next verse. He says, I said to the king, may the king live forever. See, Nehemiah was scared. He's like, oh no, king, I'm sorry. <laughs> live forever, king, I'm sorry. Why should my face not look sad, though, when the, when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? By saying, let the king live forever, Nehemiah was saying, I love you, Xerxes. I respect you, Xerxes. You're a king, king. I, I got love for you, a king, king. I respect you. But my people are suffering. My city's in ruins. I have the blues. When was the last time the state of this city broke your heart? When was the last time the thing that was burning in you wasn't the fact that you didn't get the promotion at work, but that somebody experienced injustice somewhere down the line, somewhere down the road in this city? When was the last time something that's happening to somebody else led you out to burn with fire and conviction. Nehemiah knows something that our success-driven culture doesn't. Nehemiah knows that no true flourishing is individual. It's always collective. Everything in life is going to pull you towards finding meaning and inquiring more. Get more money. Get a bigger house. Get better kids. Oh, you can't do that. Oops. <laughs> Listen, y'all, I tried about three times, but... It ain't work. It ain't work. So I'm stuck with what I got. I'm stuck with what I got. Y'all pray for your boy. Um, but, but all of that acquisition is worthless with, if parts of your city are burning down to the ground with racism, sexism, and classism. Amen. Our flourishing as individuals is bound up with the whole. When our neighbors flourish, we flourish. This is the heart of Matthew 25. This is why Jesus says, truly I tell you that whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Jesus is the king whose identity is bound up with the peasant. Jesus is the king that willingly chooses to have his flourishing interconnected with the least, not with the greatest. And likewise, Nehemiah doesn't identify with the royal robes and the golden palace that he lives in. Instead, he identifies with the tattered robes and the burnt down shacks that his people are living in. And for some of you, that means that you're going to have to completely reorient your life. If we're really going to take being a fearless church seriously, if this is not just going to be another, another conference and another high and another, because that's what we do in church. We just come to church to get high. This is our drug of choice. 
We just come here and get high every week and go home and don't change. If this is, if this is really going to be something that's going to take root in your life and actually change in such a way that you, see it, that you see the kingdom come and his will be done in Bloomington normal as it is in heaven, then you're going to have to leave some luxuries, family, because some of the things that you love a lot are hindering God's call on your life. Maybe you need to sell your house and move into the hood to do justice. Maybe you need to go back to school. Somebody's spouse is like, yep, I told you. <laughs> you heard the pastor, you heard him. <laughs> Maybe you need to leave that comfortable job that pays well oof, and allows you to vacation three times a year. Sometimes, maybe you got to leave that job to start that business. See, Nehemiah's proximity to suffering doesn't determine his willingness to identify with it. Oh my God, don't miss that. Every time we love beyond the borders of our proximity, we're doing a dangerous thing. We're doing a fearless thing. We're doing a gospel thing. We're walking in the kind of love that changes the world. This was the love that moved Jesus out of the palace and into the manger. This was the love that inspired Jesus to trade the crown for a cross. This was the love that raised Jesus from the dead. Can we give God glory for that kind of love? All right, my last point, I'm out your way. I'm actually doing good on time. Somebody pray for me in the back. I know you did. Somebody was like, Lord, help this chocolate brother just get through this. Just help him get through this word, Lord. I'm trying to eat. Point three. Point three. Leading with conviction forces us to move out in courage. Leading with conviction forces us to move out in courage. Look with me at verses four and five. The Bible says, the king said to me, what you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Nehemiah no longer sees a problem. He now sees himself as a part of the solution. Can I give you something for free? My church is so tired of me saying this. They're like, man, I'm glad you're saying this somewhere else. <laughs> I say this same almost every week. But, he, but, but, but here's something for free for you. If God has led you to identify a problem, it's because he's also calling you to be a part of the solution. Yes. Yes. God never calls us to complain about anything. In fact, in fact, in fact, I made a promise to God and myself. I said, I will no longer complain about things that I'm not willing to change. Somebody in here needs to make that promise too. Amen. Stop complaining about things you're not willing to change because that's worthless energy. Instead, turn that into a prayer. At least God could do something with it, amen? amen? If God has led you to identify a problem, it's because he's calling you to be a part of the solution. Nehemiah's response to the king wasn't, if it pleases the king, send somebody else. It's, that's what we do. <laughs> well, Lord Jesus, you know, I know this is a problem in the city, but, you know, if it pleases you, send Pastor Mike to give a good word. <laughs> I brought them to church, Lord. I did my job. No, no, no. He, he, he doesn't say, please send someone else to Judah with resources to rebuild it. Nehemiah's love was too strong to excuse himself from meaningful action. Instead, he says to the king, if it pleases the king, send me to Judah so that I may rebuild it. Here's a powerful question for us. What have you looked to King Jesus, oof, the real king, and said, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, send me. Don't send my cousin, don't, don't, don't send my coworker, don't, 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 don't send my pastor, send, send me. Some use me. You, I don't want to just exist anymore. I don't want to just, I don't want to just exist. I, I want to live. I, I want to experience the power of your spirit flowing through me and transforming lives through me. I, I want to experience the fullness of the gifts and fruit you've put inside of me. Send, send me. See, obedience always says, send me. Those two words are at the heart of godly conviction. Send, send me. You, you know you're on assignment from God if whatever you feel called to looks unconquerable but still compels you to say to King Jesus, send me. 
Nehemiah courageously asked the king to send him, and look at what happens next. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? Xerxes wants his cupbearer back. Xerxes is like, all right, Nehemiah, you ain't going to use all your vacation time trying to do a... You're going to have to get... I mean, I mean, you got six weeks, player. You're going to get, you're gonna have to get there and get... Me. <laughs> Oh, we're going to fight. We're going to get another cup there now. See you know what I'm saying? Like, but here's, what's, here's what we need to see. But before Xerxes agrees to send Nehemiah to Jerusalem to rebuild his walls, the Bible puts a little meaningless detail in there. It seems meaningless. It says, uh, the queen was sitting beside him. But here's something we have to learn about God's word. There, there is no such thing as a meaningless detail. In the word of God, every comma, every period, every jot, every, every exclamation point, every question mark, every period <laughs> is meaningful. So who was this queen that was so important that the writer of Nehemiah thought she were, that, that it was worth noting her, though she doesn't do anything in the story but sit next to the king? Well, most scholars think this mysterious unnamed queen was none other than Queen Esther. Can I talk about Queen Esther for a second? Queen Esther is one of my heroes in the faith. Queen Esther was a woman whose courage and boldness literally saved her people from extinction. Her life was most famously summed up in the statement she made to her cousin Mordecai when she was about to go break an unjust law in in, in Persia. And she says to her cousin Mordecai simply this. She says, everybody go fast for a couple days. And then she says this, if I perish, I perish. Nehemiah certainly would have learned godly conviction from Queen Esther. And like Nehemiah, Esther didn't see her status as something detached from the suffering of her people. She likewise threw herself into the fire and said, God, use me even if it kills me. That's conviction. Conviction is the kind of faith that says to Jesus, use me even if it kills me. And like Nehemiah and Esther, We see that God is calling us to this kind of faith and conviction. But Nehemiah is not done yet. In the next few verses, he makes the biggest, boldest, most audacious request that he's made in this entire passage. You ready for it? Look at this as I get ready to close. Look at this. He says, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence that I will occupy. Because, you know, a brother need a house too. (laughs) And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. These verses tell us that Nehemiah didn't just move in compassion and courage, he moved in strategy. It's going to take strategy to change the systems God is going to call you to fight in this world. He asked the king for two things, two things. He asked him for protection and provision. Nehemiah knows that he can't be successful without a plan. So he says, Xerxes, can you give all of the power, of, of all of the political power of the Persian empire to a marginal people to make sure that none of these other bigger nations stop us from doing the work of rebuilding our city? Now, that's an incredibly bold move by itself because he's asking the king of the most powerful nation in the world to put all his political allies on the line to help a marginal people who nobody even really cares about. That's a bold move. But, but, but if that's not crazy enough, he then turns to the king and says, oh yeah, oh yeah, and I want you to write a check for it. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, listen, I'm going to need you to write a check. I'm going to need you to pay for all that too. I'm going to need you to write a check. I'm going to need you to send timber for the gates. We're going to need a little bit of wood for the fortress of the temple. We're going to need some walls for the city. And you know, I'm going to need a house, O king. I'm going to need you to send a little couple checks for my crib because, you know, brother can't just go from the palace back to the projects. Like, I got (laughs) to... I got to be chilling somewhere. (laughs) A request this extravagant shouldn't even be asked, much less granted. But why was Nehemiah's request granted? Oh my God, I love this part of this text. Was it because of his eloquence? Nope. Was it because of his education? Nope. Was it because of his experience? Nope. Was it because of his networking skills? 
Lord knows he ain't had those. <laughs> nope. Nehemiah says, my request was granted as audacious and fearless as it was because the gracious hand of my God was upon me. Nehemiah knows that whatever favor he's attained, it's because of the grace of God. This is the place where real change happens. This is the place where really becoming an influencer starts. How in awe are you of the grace of God in your life? Nehemiah hasn't organized the people, built a wall, faced opposition, but he knows he's going to be successful in all of this because he's already been deeply moved by the grace of God. Some of you have been Christians for so long that you don't even remember what a fresh encounter with grace feels like. You're so accustomed to playing the religious game, doing the right thing but not the righteous thing, following the rules but not pursuing deep relationship with God and others. And the results are clear. You've become spiritually complacent. You've lost the God vision that we're headed for a new heaven and a new earth, and our calling now is to alert this present world that a better world is coming. Hallelujah. And this is the call of God to you in this sermon to move out of that comfort, to put on conviction, but it starts with a fresh encounter, with a fresh encounter with his grace. But others of you in here are suffering. You're well aware of your need for the grace of God. You're suffering like the people in, in Jerusalem. You feel like an exile in your own homeland, and, and you're asking God, where can I find protection and provision from just to get through the next day? Regardless of where you are, let this Nehemiah point you to the true Nehemiah. Because this Nehemiah, as important as he was, was only a shadow of the true Nehemiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus was the one in the real palace, in the presence of the real king, God the Father. Jesus was the one who had every right to stay in the comfort of the palace while the world burned up in ruins. But instead, Jesus saw the suffering of humanity and said to the Father, if it pleases you, send me. But Jesus didn't go out with a royal decree of protection and provision like Nehemiah did. Instead, Jesus went out with the royal decree to sacrifice his life, to become our protection and provision. Jesus knew that if his mission was successful, it was only going to end one way, with him stretched out on the cross. Jesus knows the risk involved with leaving safety. Jesus knows the risk involved with pursuing being fearless. But he also knows that there's no salvation without sacrifice. And we are sitting in here today because of the fearlessness of our God who looked sin, death, and Satan in the face and said, if I perish, I perish, but send me. How dare we not give that gift back to a dying world that needs it? So today as I close, ask yourself this, what sacrifices do I need to make to become a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better mother, a better son, a better daughter, a better friend, a better family member, a better neighbor? Shoot, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Some of us forgot that commandment. We was like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your... Jesus said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. What do I have to do to become a better neighbor? What do I have to do to become a better co-worker? God's call on your life may not be to rebuild a city, but his call on your life is always to reject comfort, put on compassion, and move out into the world with the courage and conviction necessary to change it. Amen. Who wants to see God do that in this city? Yeah. If you do, extend your hand to me as I pray over you and as I pray over this church and over the reach that this conference is going to have long beyond 
where we are right now. Extend your hand to me if you want that. Heavenly Father, I'm praying now in Jesus' name. You see the hands of your people. You see that our heart is to move out into this world with conviction. God, we don't want to be comfortable anymore. We don't want to be the same anymore. We don't want to have the same old issues and the same old problems and the same old fears and the same old shortcomings. We want to see you do a new thing. Your word says at the end of time, you're going to say, behold, I'm making all things new. Father, we are hungry now. We don't want to wait to heaven to see all things be made new. We want to see you do it on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, use us as your people. We ain't much. We're not prophets. We're not priests. We're a lot like Nehemiah. We're just cupbearers. But God, thank you for the testimony of a cupbearer that you can use one cupbearer's courage to rebuild an entire city. God, use us. Send us out in faith tonight. Bring us back here tomorrow and deposit into, this, into the spirit and heart of your people everything you need to get to us so that we can become the courageous, fearless, influential people you died and rose for us to be. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.